we have this problem where people in power speak on behalf of particular groups they do not belong to. And oftentimes these are groups that are disadvantaged groups, and uh, when the people in power speak on their behalf, that's how they maintain their legitimacy. They, they say, I understand that group, and therefore I should have the power to make all these decisions. And sometimes people from those groups sort of hear what they're saying, and they're like, eh, that's kind of right, but not exactly right. They don't really understand me. Or sometimes they're just like, that's actually completely wrong about what people in my group want or believe. They're just using that as an excuse to do whatever they want to do. And I think this is also, it goes along with another problem, which is the power of um, elite people to interpret data and statistics about groups they don't belong to. So this could be some statistics some academic has come up with. It could be a poll that could be a biased poll. Um, or it could even be like an election. Like, why did that group vote that way? Well, I mean, voting is sort of one of the bases of democracy, but if the elites get to determine um, the meaning of the vote, like I know why that group voted that way, it was because something that holds them in power, right? Be it was because um, they wanted someone like me to come along and save the day according to my own uh, principles and values. So this is a huge problem. And I'd like to think through in this video how can pluralism and the possibility of pluralistic governance systems in online spaces actually counteract this problem? Because I truly believe that the, the spaces of deliberation where people talk about public policy ideas and talk about what they want their leaders to do, those spaces are part of democracy. And if people who are disadvantaged, or if the population in general, does not have a place in the uh, public dialogue that actually can reach its way up to people in power to sort of challenge their assumptions and all of that, then our democratic system isn't functioning as well as it could be. So we need to get really creative in figuring out how can we use new technologies to actually improve democracy. And the way I started to think about this is I did a video on pluralism, sort of making the case that pluralism is the new federalism. At this point, you might ask, what is pluralism exactly? And um, I have a video explaining this in more detail, but one way of thinking of it is if you have a governance system, instead of using one person, one vote, you have groups of people where the groups have meaning and the groups have some power to self-govern, but you're still at the same time trying to create cooperation across groups and create sort of governance of the whole ecosystem. So this is why I compare this to federalism, because federalism is basically that exactly, except these subgroups are the states, in the United States at least. Whereas with pluralism, you still have the self-governance structure of the smaller groups, but the smaller groups can be um, determined in other ways besides just geography. All right, so how do these groups get determined? And I do think there's going to be a lot of different setups that might work or might be experimented with. Um, for example, you could just let anyone who wants to join a group join. Or you could have a list of community rules that people have to agree to first. But in the case we're talking about, where elites are speaking on behalf of certain groups, it could be that you have to prove membership in a certain group. Like maybe you have to prove your income is below a certain threshold. Um, there could be professional groups, like are you part of the working class? Um, you could prove that in various ways. There might be a group of people that made up those who lost their job in the last year, where you have to prove that's true in order to join the group. So having mechanisms that were valid and true that people believed in would actually be pretty important if you wanted to use pluralistic communities to define their own 
beliefs and values and public image. And I realize this sounds really wacky if you try to sort of implement pluralism on the same system we have. So I think the better place to start playing around with some of these new governance tools is in the online space, where some of the democratic process actually goes down. And in particular, could we create online spaces where groups of people could come together and self-govern to determine what do we want the public to know about our, our group's viewpoint? Like, what's the range of viewpoints within our group? What are the viewpoints that are more common? What are the desires and hopes and motivations of people in our viewpoint? If they had a self-governing uh, group, however they chose to self-govern, that sort of put out a piece of information that, that could challenge people in power who are trying to speak on their behalf then that could be just another piece of information that people could use to hold power in check. And as I started thinking about this, I realized that I'd actually heard about an idea like this at a conference a few years ago. So this was a Heterodox Academy conference, and it was a session on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and some creative approaches to DEI. And I wish I could find which college this was and who the speaker was. I, I couldn't find it online, but if I do find it, I will put a link below to that person's website and the website with any more information about this. But me not being able to find it was not sufficient reason for me not to talk about it because it was such a good idea. Um, so the person speaking was head of her DEI division in her college, and she was thinking about freshman orientation and what kinds of uh, diversity training would be appropriate for freshman orientation. And instead of having sort of the freshman orientation diversity training, which comes from the national level, which has perhaps some stereotypes about groups that they're sometimes frustrated with, she looked at the population on campus and said, Actually, we have some sort of subsets of Hispanic groups that are cohesive and are well represented on our, on our campus. Why don't we bring those students together and ask them, what would you like incoming freshmen to know about your group? And of course, the process of doing that, and, and there were different, different groups represented that could sort of come together in one of these clusters. The process sort of uncovered um, the diversity of views, but also sometimes common frustrations among those groups that when they interacted with people who didn't understand their culture, what, what would they prefer people on campus to know about their culture? And even if it wasn't 100% agreement, could they sort of self-govern in putting out a pamphlet of some sort or an information session that would just orient incoming freshmen to here's how these people like to be understood on average, and here's the diversity of their views on this, and here's how to think about this group in a more nuanced and complex way. I just thought that was so powerful, and it was a really good example of pluralism. Like, um, pluralism involves self-governance of some sort, and I think something similar could be designed online. I don't know exactly the parameters of what it would look like, but um, if we think about a website that's intentionally designed for groups to come together and create... Um, pushback against misperceptions people have about their group and, and the diversity within their group or the um, stereotypes of their group. Now, you'd have to be careful about this because, of course, um, anytime any group gains legitimacy, any space, whether that space is a website or an organization or a company, if it starts to gain legitimacy, that's power and power sources are going to come and try to hijack that for its own purposes. So I think the development of governance that could actually do this in a way that people would see as valid is going to have to take a bunch of iterations where um, we try it out, we get it wrong, power comes in and just imposes their will. All of this sort of stuff is going to happen, but I think there could be an evolutionary process toward a more pluralistic governance of groups 
perceptions of their their own selves, perceptions of that group as a whole, that could be a nice counterbalance to people in power trying to just hijack the conversation. Oh, and another cool thing about pluralism is that um, it should promote cooperation across groups. So obviously, polarization is a huge problem right now. And if you could structure um, incentives across groups such that the groups were, are meant to cooperate, th that they get value from finding common points across different groups. I mean, I think that was something that the founders of the Constitution had in mind when they wanted states to learn to cooperate to come up with a federal government that represented each of the states' groups well. And building in incentives to cooperate, I think, would be a real important thing in terms of making pluralism work. So I just thought this was a fun and important use case of pluralism that could be really valuable. Um, and, and I'm not saying that just because a group says they want to be perceived this way, nobody could ever say anything that contradicts that. Uh, obviously, sometimes you might need to say, no, people in that group, from my experience, are kind of mean, and of course that group isn't going to see their own flaws. But just having that piece of information, how do they want themselves to be seen, would be super, super useful. If you generally enjoy hearing creative ways that different communities can self-govern, you might be interested in my video on sorticians, which I'll link to here.